Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is comics legend Jerry Conway. Jerry, welcome to Comic Culture. Hi, I'm glad to be here. So Jerry, you have written comics that um, are basically uh, the, the underpinnings of a lot of universes. And I'm wondering, you're still writing comics today, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the differences of, of working in 2018 versus working in the 70s and 80s. Well, uh, for one thing, I th I, I'd like to think I'm a better writer today. Uh, but, for the, but I think the major difference between uh, the comic book uh, business as, uh, in terms of writing and creating uh, today versus uh, the early 70s uh, is the weight that the material has uh, for the companies that uh, are producing it. Uh, in the early 70s, comics were considered very disposable, even even at the top company, you know, like DC Comics, which was uh, uh, still at that point the, the, the best selling of the companies. Uh, comics were disposable, and many of us thought that we were actually uh, writing and creating comics during a period of decline that was going to end with uh, the business folding up in five or ten years. Uh, so there was a kind of a more freewheeling attitude towards what you did, you know, the, especially at Marvel, where because of the structure of the editorial department, there was not a lot of supervision of the individual writers and artists. Uh, we had one editor in chief, uh, an assistant editor and a couple of uh, uh, proofreaders, and that pretty much uh, covered 50 titles a month, which meant that the individual writers were pretty much their own uh, story editors, uh, which allowed us to, you know, go off in a lot of different directions that we might other, might not otherwise have been able to do. Today, uh, there's much more supervision and much more top-down management uh, because the properties are considered f very, very, very valuable to the companies that own them, and as a result, uh, they don't want to make mistakes, which also leads to not being potentially as open to uh, momentary inspiration by the creators. And it seems that uh, now uh, the changes that you were making in the 70s to characters and to situations would be something that uh, can't really be done and if they are made they have to be sort of reset. Um, yeah. Now, <clears throat> during your time uh, you've worked with some of the greatest artists in comics and I was wondering when you're working with someone like a, a John Romita or a Ross Andrew or a Garcia Lopez um, are you working to their strengths? Are you talking to them about what the story ideas, or are you just saying, you know, have at it? Well, when I was working at Marvel in the 70s, I was, uh, all of those relationships uh, were collaborative, very collaborative. Uh, the more that I knew about what a, an artist was interested in and what his strengths were, the easier my job became uh, as a creator. Uh, so naturally, I would want to, you know, uh, find out as much of, of what interested the artist as I possibly could. And then I would try to write to that uh, because, you know, you, 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 this is your partner. Uh, this is someone who uh, has as much at stake, I think, in the ultimate product as you do as a writer. Um, and that's a resource, you know, creative resource that you'd be foolish to, uh, to, to look away from. Uh, I had a lot of, I, the other aspect of it is, is that in the early 70s, I was relatively uh, uh, inexperienced. I mean, I'd been writing comics for two or three years, but I hadn't written any superhero comics. So when I took over a book like Spider-Man, uh, John Rivita, who was the artist on the book, was really the lead on that book. And uh, he was the one who uh, would guide me, you know, and, and help me understand uh, how to structure the stories and how to approach the characters. Uh, and then eventually when I started working with Ross, it was more of a, an equal collaboration because we were both, you know, at, at a similar level of experience with those characters. And that's interesting um, that, you know, you're talking about learning from your uh, collaborator, whereas it seems um, now it's, it's sort of a specialty where the, the writer might not get to speak too much with the artist, or if they do, it's just more of... Uh, if you take a look at uh, contemporary script, maybe a Grant Morrison, it sure. seems that, that everything is down to the last detail. 
Um, so it's just interesting that you seem to have had that flexibility that you kind of rolled with the punches after you set up that basic idea, depending on what the art looked like. Right. Well, well, back then too at Marvel, we were working under what was known as the Marvel method, which uh, was uh, a process where you created an outline or story, a story premise. And with the you know with the artist, the artist would take that and uh, develop it into you know sequential art, and then you as the writer would come in afterwards and uh, write dialogue and and try to fix any story problems that weren't clear in the art, or uh, maybe even reinterpret some scenes uh, because they weren't they didn't play exactly the way that uh, you thought they would. Uh, so there was much more. <clears throat> uh, it was much more of a collaborative uh, medium. But that's not to say that that you don't do that today with artists. Uh, when someone like like I mean, if you read the script for um, Watchmen uh, that Alan Moore gave to Dave Gibbons, uh, it doesn't really seem like Dave uh, Gibbons has very much uh, leeway in in what he does. But that pr script was a pro was a product of a, an intense collaboration in the creative stages between Moore and Gibbons, and was more of a document to um, express their mutual understanding of what was going to happen. I think in those in those pages, and that's true. I think for a lot of writers and artists working today, uh, <clears throat> the scripts, uh, unless unless you don't know who the artist is going to be, you are collaborating with, with that artist. I, I wrote, uh, recently wrote a book called Carnage, uh, in which my uh, artist was Mike Perkins. And Mike and I uh, didn't directly collaborate in the sense that I had collaborated with Ross Andrew or Gene Colan, but during the course of working on the project, I, I you know, understood where his interests lay, uh, what he liked to do, and I started writing uh, scenes that I knew he would, you know, kick, uh, knock out of the park. Uh, I played his strengths because I understood where he was coming from. And then he would mention occasionally to me, either directly or through uh, the editor, you know, that there was a particular story point that he was interested in or something that, that piqued his uh, uh, creative uh, juices, you know, and, and I, would, I would dive into that. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of misleading to look at the scripts as being the sole uh, template. You know, the temp it, it, it's, it's, sometimes it's, it's the result of the collaboration already existing, you know, when, you, when the script comes into, uh, comes into play. You were saying that uh, early on in your career there was not a lot of editorial uh, guidance at Marvel. Uh, and in your career, you were not only the writer of many books, you were also the, the writer-editor. I know when you were on Justice League or Firestorm, that was uh, the role that you had. And I'm wondering, when you are uh, sort of that administrator and the artist, how do you uh, do that job and how do you do the creative part of that administrative position? Well. I don't know that I was a particularly good editor, <laughs> so I don't know that I, I can say that, uh, that, there's, a, that there's some wise uh, uh, insights that I have on it. Um, I think that uh, your, your first obligation is to the story, uh, whatever the story is. And when you're working with an artist and working in an administrative capacity, uh, you're still trying to serve the story as much as anything else. I mean, there are obviously uh, publishing requirements that have to be met. You know, you have to meet schedules and deadlines and, you know, make decisions on who's available and who isn't available. <clears throat> that may not have anything to do with the quality of the material, but just simply the, the realities of the case. And one, th one thing that has definitely changed over the last uh, couple of decades is uh, that uh, both companies, to a, to a degree, have kind of abandoned the idea of um, regular schedules for books, uh, and, and that that's been both good and bad. I mean, it's good in the sense that sometimes that leads to a more cohesive, creative uh, uh, product uh, uh, in the end, but it does reduce, you know, the uh, the ability to produce that monthly. Uh, uh, story that in itself trying to fix the problems of uh, that are created by 
deadlines can lead to some interesting creative choices. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you end up putting an artist on a book uh, just because you have to make, make a deadline that ends up giving you a much more interesting look than you would have had otherwise uh, if you had just stuck with the original artist that you'd, that you'd planned on. Uh, but, you know, it's all, it's all, it's, there is no right way to do it, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Well, you, you pose an interesting point, which is, um, in the, when I was reading a lot of comics in the 80s and the 90s, you'd get the occasional fill-in book, but there was always that, um, you know, expectation that I would go to the local comic shop or to uh, the convenience store and I'd pick up those, uh, those comic books. Now the writing seems to be a lot more towards the trades and those complete story yes. arcs. Uh, how does that affect you as a writer? Is it, is it easier because you can just tell a story and not worry about that deadline, or is it, is it something where you prefer well, just that it, pressure? It, uh, it, it was hard for me to learn when I when I came back to writing comics a few years ago. Uh, I, I was determined to, to to do a better job at it than I felt that I had done originally. But <clears throat> one big difference between the way that I would work back in uh, uh, the '70s and '80s was that I would, I would sprinkle story uh, 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 premises you know, in, in any given issue that, may or, that I may or may not pick up on uh, later. But it was mostly for my benefit to give me something to, go, to fall into you know, two or three months down the line because I was on that deadline basis of turning out a monthly book you know, and I was writing actually quite a few books. Um, when you're, when you're committing to a five-part story or a six-part story that's going to be brought into a trade, you have to actually know everything that you're going to do for that six-month period, and you can't really be spontaneous. Uh, you, have to, you have to follow the plan. And that's good in one sense, because it, it forces discipline upon you as a creator. But it's also unfortunate in another sense, because it, it it prevents you from suddenly changing course and uh, recognizing that the story that you're telling isn't the story that needs to be told with this particular given situation and uh, just throwing the whole thing out the window and turning it a 180 degree direction. Um, that was something we could do. You know, we could we could say, you know, this this story uh, is getting kind of dull. Let's uh, th let's introduce the inhumans <laughs> you know I mean, it's like what the heck you know we'll just do that um, and now we'd have to plan that for like two years in advance and tie it into an event and make sure that the trade paperback you know was a full five issues and even though the story only needed four uh you know etc 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 so there's there are compromises that are made as a result of this kind of as i say top-down management uh, of, uh, based on what works from a sales point of view rather than what works from a creative point of view. And speaking of, uh, I guess, a creative point of view, you, you said uh, that, uh, I guess you're alluding to the sort of that decompressed storytelling where, uh, you know, the Galactus comes down to the Fantastic Four fights. I mean, it's two issues, but it, if they were doing it now, someone said it would take, right. you know, 12 Twelve issues to do 12, that. Zero, Twelve issues and, and, and several spinoffs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so, I, was, think, I was just going to say, I, 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 there, there are positive and negatives to that. I mean, the decompressed storytelling allows you more room for individual character development uh, and for um, uh, a, a kind of byplay in dialogue uh, that was not really practical before. Uh, and at the same time uh, allows you to really uh, expand the scope of, of the art, you know, so that, that, it, that you, you could, I, I remember back in the 60s, it was this really dramatic moment when Jim Steranko did a issue of S.H.I.E.L.D. that had a four page spread. Uh, you basically had to buy two books to see this. It was just phenomenal. It was. Uh, uh, a fight scene that, that took place over four pages. And that was both a natural outgrowth of what Kirby had been setting up, you know, which is these ever larger and larger uh, uh, scenes. But it was also, this was in a book that where, where I think Nick Fury's adventures took 13 pages. So you basically, at that point, <laughs> just devoted one third of the entire story to one scene, uh, 
And that's, a, that's, that's decompression. Um, but what we're seeing now is, a, is, is taking, that, a, a, taking that storytelling technique and, and expanding it across the board. Uh, and some books, I think, that's justifiable, justifiable, and in others it might not be. A series like the X-Men or the Avengers or Justice League, uh, that kind of st- expanded storytelling, decompressed storytelling makes sense. For uh, a series of, about a solo character who's you know, involved in uh, 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 a single life, <laughs> you know, it really might not make sense. So uh, there, there's a conflict there. Uh, between form and uh, uh, content. You had mentioned uh, a little while ago that you were writing a a number of books, and I I know that um, when I was really uh, reading a lot of comics in the 80s, you were working on not only many different books, uh, you had Justice League and Firestorm, but you also had uh, different genres uh, that you were working on. You had uh, Atari Force, which is another one of those uh, gems from the 80s, and uh, a book that is near and dear to my heart, Cinder and Ash. Uh, yes. So I'm wondering, when you're working on these different books, as a writer, obviously it lets you, you know, scratch a lot of itches, but uh, how do you keep everything you know, working in your head so that everything kind of works? Well, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, was also, I think at that time I was also writing Scalp Hunter, which was a Western, um, and um, Justice League, and then uh, uh, you know, various solo characters and uh, science fiction books like uh, Atari Force and... Uh, 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 a couple of others. So, in in one sense, it's it's like a cleansing of the palate. You know, you're you're able to to. I was able to um, uh, write a Justice League story and then switch gears and write a Scalp Hunter story, and that helps. You know, because it keeps you fresh when you go back to doing the superhero group book. Uh, that the thing that you've just re- uh, written immediately before is in a completely different uh, mindset. So, uh, from my point of view, it was it was a, it was a gift, you know, to have that many different uh, 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 story genres, you know, to, to play in. Uh, but the other component of that was that I was writing a, uh, far too many books, uh, so. <laughs> I think at one point in the 80s, I was, uh, or late 70s, I was writing five books a month, what amounted to five books a month. Uh, and that inevitably meant that, you know, I was not going to be paying attention uh, as deeply as I should to, you know, at least one or two of those books. But the fact that they were different genres did help me, you know, maintain some, some focus, you know, because I could be thinking about scalp under, you know, and, uh, and, and the latest Civil War uh, plot that I was, I was working on uh, while scripting a, an issue of Legion of Superheroes, you know, so, so it, it didn't confuse me as much then. And it's interesting, too, because um, a book like Firestorm is, I guess, was geared towards a, a I don't want to say a younger reader, but, but yeah, younger in terms of comics. It's, it's a fun adventure about a teenager who, you know, confused into mm-hmm. this great character. But then you also have, uh, again, Cinder and Ash, a, a great miniseries that's clearly uh, for a mature and, uh, I guess, grown-up audience. So right. as a writer, how are you balancing, you know, I know that this demographic will appreciate this storyline, and I know, or at least I hope this demographic will appreciate this storyline. Well, partly it's, it's that I'm writing for myself, usually. Uh, I, I'm usually writing what, what interests me and what entertains me. So. Uh, when I was writing Firestorm, I was writing for uh, 15-year-old Jerry, you know, who uh, loved fun books, you know, loved uh, <clears throat> silliness, I mean, embraced silliness and, and thought silliness was the end goal of everything. You know, uh, I, I, I still feel that way about superhero comics, uh, that, that they're at their best when they embrace their inherent silliness. Uh, but when I was writing Cinder and Ash, I was writing for the the Jerry that really enjoys uh, film noir and uh, really enjoys uh, uh, thrillers and uh, the mystery novels of Lawrence Block, and uh, you know was was obsessed with that part of uh, uh, the world. So it, the the separation isn't that hard. I was I, I was writing. Uh, with those separate, those separate mindsets, 
And I guess one of my gifts, and it's what, what helped me when I went into television, was that I was able to slip into different genres uh, because I could, I, I'm a fan of, of a whole variety of things. <laughs> Uh, and it wasn't a matter of writing to an audience. It was more, more, more a matter of tapping into that part of me that, that preferred that type of story. As a writer, it's a, a creative uh, outlet. It's, it's also a risk because you're trying to tell something that's new and, and has some meaning to you. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll take a creative risk and it might not hit with the audience or, yeah. or uh, it will hit with the audience later on. So when you're working on a book and, and maybe you know, the sales don't go the right way or something like that, when you leave a book, how do you feel when someone else comes in and changes the direction or if you thought something was really working and it just you know, wasn't the call that you had to make? If they're successful at it, I, I'm, I usually feel like, yeah, that's, that's a, that, that was a good way to take that. You know, I mean, uh, 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 taking The Punisher, for example. Uh, when I uh, created The Punisher, he was a supervillain, you know, uh, who had anti-heroic aspects. Uh, and as such, you know, in the in the the world of uh, Spider-Man of the of the uh, uh, 70s, he was written broadly. He was written, you know, in a very um, uh, uh, over-the-top sort of manner, uh, not with a, a gritty realism. Uh, but then, when he was brought back by Stephen Grant, uh, you know, years later. Um, they they found a voice for him that was much grittier, much uh, darker, and uh, was very successful. So I was fine with that. I thought that's a good take. That that sounds great. Uh, but by contrast, uh, I created. You know, we were talking about Firestorm. It was a successful book when I was writing. It. When I left it, I left it for reasons that had nothing to do with the the sales. Uh, but the people who came in after me constantly redefined the book and constantly uh, missed the point <laughs> you know, of, what, of what made the book work and what made the character work, you know, which was this archetypical teenage uh, adult conflict. Uh, you know, that, that's like, it, was, was, it couldn't have been more obvious that, that what we're dealing with here is uh, teenage rebellion against adult authority. And that's, a, that's a, uh, an archetype that uh, I, I happen to look upon, but it worked. And it worked well. And for some reason, for decades after that, uh, the creators who came after uh, just refused to go back to that form. And the book has, the character has never been as popular as it was when uh, it was originally conceived. And I've never understood what that was about. So I think it, it's more about if I see my characters or books that I've written uh, being mismanaged you know, so that they're not as successful as when I had done them, uh, that upsets me because it, it feels like, you know, I, I, I handed you this, this nice piece of work and you're, you're uh, ruining it. But if you take something that I created and you make it even better, like Ms. Marvel, for example, becomes under Kelly uh, Sue DeConnick, uh, Captain Marvel, and she does an amazing job of updating and changing that character so that it's much more relevant. I'm like, this is wonderful. I mean, it look, makes me look good because I, I had some participation in uh, assembling that character in the first place. But, you know, it's, it's terrific. It's, you're, you're making all of us look better. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, plus, as a fan, I like reading good stuff. So if it's good stuff, I'm happy. Uh, where I get upset is when it's bad stuff. <laughs> Now, when you watch uh, uh, the films, the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the DC films or all of the DC series on uh, the CW, they seem to be taking a lot of uh, characters and stories that you've created and sort of condensing them into what fits their, uh, their mm -hmm. format. Um, so when you look back at that, what sort of career satisfaction do you get knowing that everyone is looking at this uh, influential work and, and kind of taking the best parts of it? Well, I'm, I'm ex extraordinarily flattered and pleased. Uh, 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 as it's probably not as well known now, but but when the Detroit Justice League, which is where a lot of these characters uh, were established, uh, characters like Vibe and Vixen and uh, uh, even Firestorm uh, was prior to that, but it was around that same era. Uh, Gypsy, uh, all these characters that are appearing on the CW shows. Uh, 
uh, when they when that when that series came out, uh, it was it it was not well received by all longtime uh, readers of the Justice League, and that should have been okay because we were really trying to reach a different audience than the longtime readers because the longtime readers weren't as interested in the book anymore. You know that's why the book had to be changed. Uh, so, so when I left the book. While that was still going on, I felt kind of let down that I had failed, you know, that I had not created a book that uh, uh, or created characters that uh, resonated for the readers. And I, I felt badly, you know, and I, I, I think I felt that uh, it was a failure. So it's kind of fun and ironic to me now that, uh, you know, decades later, here, here these characters are becoming uh, introduced to are being introduced to a new audience through television and have fan bases. <laughs> That's just great. Uh, and I, I credit Jeff Johns for that because, Jeff, uh, as I think I mentioned to you before the show started, uh, Jeff was a comic book reader uh, of the, and a fan of the Justice League as a kid uh, and grew up in Detroit, and that was the era that he read those comics in. So when he, I guess, became uh, uh, the creative officer uh, at DC and had influence over what characters would be would be uh, 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 suggested or promoted, you know, that was the book he went uh, and and drew from. So I'm, I'm, it's it's a happy happy. Uh, coincidence for me, and, and I'm really pleased with the way that they've, uh, they've addressed them. Jerry, I'm amazed to say that we are out of time. It's been a, a great conversation. I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today, and I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon.